I think I benefited from being born and raised in Brooklyn. That was one of the most cosmopolitan neighborhoods. And that was one of the great joys about it. It's where you learned you didn't dislike anybody because he was an Italian, a Jew, or an Irishman, or what else. We also have, on the other side of the coin, we have a bad bunch of fellas. Gangsters, we had shootings in the street. My father, Jacob Kaminsky, was a simple tailor and pleased to be one. When I was 13, my mother died. Danny was a student at the same school with me. We did our homework together, you should know from it. We never understood what the homework was. We were laughing and laughing and laughing. That's all we did. So they sent for a witch with a terrible twitch to ask how my future impressed her. She took one look at me and cried, he 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 What else could he be but a jester? Danny worked at a store that dispenses ice cream cones. He put so much stuff into the class, he couldn't get it out. They found out what he was doing, they fired him. <laughs> he worked for an insurance company, and he made up Lupa. A real big mistake. I don't think he worked there more than a day. Out on his ass. I ran away from home for the simple reason that I was bursting with curiosity about the world outside of Brooklyn. I talked a pal of mine, Louis Eisen, into going along. We both had a, an ear for music. We loved melodious tunes. And we used to sing, and when we sang, we called ourselves the Harmony Kings, also Red and Blackie. I was about 12 when Danny arrived with his pal, uh, Lou Eisen, and they were a uh, harmony team. And when they came to White Row, they continued to sing together. In addition to the tennis courts and the golf course and the horseback riding and the swimming and the boating, in the evening, they would all be treated to some sort of entertainment. Those kind of places were really the training ground for entertainers. Summer stock was great for actors, but for entertainers, singers, dancers, and comedians, the Boar Circuit was the best place. The first time I ever saw Danny, all the people in the camp were crowded under that front porch or around it, and he was going insane, just insane, doing all these crazy, crazy things and making them laugh so hard. <laughs> he was a tumor. Somebody say at the edge of a pool, they push him into the pool, that sort of thing, that's a tumor or fall into the water, you know. Have his finger up his nose and fall into the water. Tumble. I think people thought he was discovered years later and that he'd suddenly gotten great, but he was always great. By 33, he was, of course, the leading act uh, at the hotel. We had a dance team, and they thought it might be fun to include Danny in some of their numbers and realize that he was a natural dancer and they taught him to dance. By the end of the summer, they were good enough to be signed up by the Marcus Show. Marcus was getting ready to go to the Orient, and he needed a dance team. The act was called Harvey, Young, and Kay, and they started off as a serious act, but then something happened that Danny fell or slipped, and when the audience laughed, then he was a comedian from then on. <laughs> Every country we went into, he had to learn something in their language so he could say it on stage. And then the audience would always die laughing. Danny had to be funny in Korea. He had to be funny in Japan to audiences who didn't understand English. So that man really learned his trade. This gibberish way that he would talk. And people would look at him like they say, what in the world language is that? German. Was haben Sie ausgehalten, das Knall wieder haben? Das Schmerzen wieder Hülle Knall? Schmerzen das Knall wieder haben? Haben Sie geflogen, die die Helm in Falz geheilt? Hast du geflogen, das Malz in die Knall wieder Hülsen? He was smart enough to know that he had to get out of it, away from that show. And we all had a big party for him. 
and he left us. For a jester's chief employment is to kill himself for your enjoyment, and a jester unemployed is nobody's fault. Danny may have thought he was a budding star in the Orient. When he got back to New York, he was anything but. In fact, he was a man without a job, without a dollar too, because his father used to have to give him the odd dollar bill. But he did get one job, which was working with an exotic stripper called Sally Rand, holding her fans in very strategic positions. Until one day a blue bottle settled on his nose and Danny lost his fans and then lost his job. He was lucky though. Henry Sherrick, who was a very well-known London impresario, came to him and said, how would you like to come to London? Play at the Dorchester Hotel. He was working with a fellow called Nick Long, but neither of them were much good. In fact, Danny said... It was a disaster. It was pathetic. It was incongruous. It was pitiful. It was shattering. It was <laughs> stunning. It was debilitating. It was thought-provoking. <laughs> and it was bloody awful. <laughs> One of the first times I ever worked with Danny was in um, the Astoria, where they made shorts. Before the big movie, there'd be the newsreel and then a comedy. Ha ha, it's <laughs> short. And this was about a dance hall. Come, my sweet. Let us trip delight sarcastic. Tickets, please. Tickets? Tickets? Stop bothering me for tickets. I can picture us both, my darling. Yes. Gliding down the river together. Music being played by gypsies. The boat being pulled by vulgar boatmen. I don't like vulgar boatmen. I like nice people. <laughs> I must say I loved doing them. They were fun. They were fun to do. And you did work with awfully good people. And of course, Danny was marvelous. Do you know there are three women to every man in the world? <laughs> Look, darling. No horse in play. And if a girl wants a man, she has to stand up and holler, give me. Look, my little owl, who's teaching this loving? You or me? The film cameos led nowhere, and Danny was soon back in a small-time satirical review put together by an ex borschbill director, Nat Lichtman. And then, one day... He brought in this very uh, sh kind of shy, quiet lady who sat down at the piano and started to demonstrate this material. And I was standing on the other side of the room, and... I'm, I'm not kidding, this is the absolute truth. I saw Danny go. I know you. You used to work in my dad's dental practice when you were 14. Then Sylvia started to play this little song. Uh, it went, uh, it's called Who Killed Cock Robin. It was just a little pop song. When who killed Cock Robin? Oh, who killed Cock Robin? Oh, da. And Danny loved the swing of it. The next thing you know, he is singing the song and doing his scat chorus, which is brilliant. And Sylvia's eyes lit up, and you could see that that was just a romance made in heaven. Candy kisses. Wrapped in paper. Just as their relationship was developing, they were both offered a job performing at a place called Camp Tamiment, which was a sort of borscht belt, only more so for trade unionists, mostly Jewish, sort of people let the same sort of food in the borscht belt, but got a lot better shows. The shows were so good that the New York impresarios, the Schubert brothers, decided to take the best of the material and turn it into their own Broadway production called the Straw Hat Review. Danny was a big success in, in the Straw Hat Review. He got marvelous notices, and lots of agents tried to get in touch with him. I think that was his first woo. But When it closed, he was out of work. In a state of, I suppose, depression, he went to Florida. And from there, he dialed Sylvia's number. He was going to propose marriage. Except that when she answered the phone, he put it down. He, he funked it. But Sylvia knew what was coming and took off for Florida herself. If I asked my parents, there would be objections, discussions, and arguments. So we eloped and were secretly married. The relationship, I should say the symbiotic relationship, between Sylvia and Danny 
was fascinating to watch. Of course, Danny leaned heavily on Sylvia's creativity. Would he have succeeded without Sylvia? My feeling is undoubtedly he would have succeeded without Sylvia. Was it very important to him at that stage in his life to have Sylvia behind him? Extremely important. Most of the material she wrote was based on what Danny could do already. And it's not detracting anything from Sylvia. I have, or I had, a kind of radar for Danny. I sensed very early that Danny was very elegant as a performer. I am Anne at the World of Paris, I shriek with chic. My act of the week goes six divorces, three runaway horses. I'm Anne at the World of Paris, the acts I sell make husbands yell. Is that the act or a two-room flat? Voilà que la drôle cette fois chez les sept rompeurs. Oh, prune dans cette toilette rare. Parleur, bedroom, basse. Let me get my paw on a little piece of straw and voila. A chapeau. At 60 bucks a throw. <laughs> it's how I pull and chew on the little things I do. I first met Danny Kaye when he exploded on the scene at La Martinique, a club on, uh, in Manhattan. He did everything. He sang. He danced, and the material was so wonderful, and what was really most outstanding is how graceful he was with all of that. And suddenly it spread all over New York that this new, there's a new guy on the block, Danny Kay. Moss went to see Danny Kay at the Martinique. In fact, he brought Garbo with him, and he thought he was wonderful, and he recognized this extraordinary talent. And when he wrote Lady in the Dark, he had a part that he wrote. I think he probably wrote it with Danny in mind. He played the effete photographer, the fashion photographer and he did it superbly. So it was really a very classy show with Moss Hart writing the book, Kurt Weill with the music, Ira Gershwin with the lyrics, and Gertrude Lawrence. Who said to me one summer night, I was so hot today I just had to take off my nail polish. <laughs> and it helped to create a new international star, Danny Kaye. And he came forth at one point and sang a song called Tchaikovsky, in which, in about one minute flat, he rattled off with impeccable precision the names of about 60 Russian composers. There's Malachevsky, Rubinstein, Arensky, and Tchaikovsky, Sapelnikov, Dmitry, F. Cherepin, Krizhenovsky, Gudovsky, Artubuchov, Onyusko, Wakimenko, Solovy, Prokofi, F. Tiamkin, Gorachenko, there's Glinka, Wunka, Botnyatsky, Rebekov, Felitsky, Metal Balakirev, Zolotorov, and Kuczynski, and Sokolov, and Kopolov, Tukalsky, and Kanovsky, Shostakovich, Bordadin, Lier, and Novakovsky, there's Lyadov, and Karaganov, Markevich, Panchenko, Dalomiski, Chervachevsky, Rabbo, Vasilenko, Servinsky, Rimsky, Kosokov, Mosovsky, and Gachan, and Fanglaza, and Fasez, and Kwikali, and Kahabanov, Servinsky, and Gachanov, from Shinsky, and the I really have to stop the subject. I've been brought apart. When he finished, they couldn't stop applauding. And they applauded and applauded and applauded. I was smiling and saying, well, for God's sake, stop. Stop applauding. Stop applauding. <laughs> Don't applaud somebody. Stop applauding. And Danny told me later, he says, as I was bowing to the applause, the thought that went through my head was, I'm out. That's the worst thing that could have happened to me. Gertrude Lawrence follows me in a moment, singing the next number. I brought the house down. I'm sure to be cut out of the show. When it was time for her to top Danny, she got up and she did the bumps and the grinds and the kicks on the proscenium. Jenny made her mind up when she was three. <laughs> she, and all of us on stage were looking at her. The audience was flabbergasted. She'd never done the high kicks and the spins and the, all of the outrageous things she did with Jenny. And of course, she tore the house down. Now, that was on a Monday night. Wednesday afternoon at the matinee, I had the sense that the audience really wasn't paying attention to me. So I looked over on the side, and there was Gertie Lawrence in the swing with a great big red handkerchief going. <laughs> What do I do? I can't go and complain to the management. She's a big star. I'm just a featured player. That night, she came out to do Jenny. And she did Jenny made her mind up when she was three. And she was having a boom. And there was a laugh where there hadn't been one before. All I did was look at her. And as she was singing, I just twitched my nose a little bit like this. 
That's all I did. And she looked at me, and I bowed to her, and she bowed to me, and she never did the red handkerchief again. <laughs> Yankee Doodle's going to town, and they want young fellas like me. My father had um, made a couple of comedies with Bob Hope, but he was always on the lookout for a comedian. He came back and he said, I've seen somebody who could be wonderful. The only thing is, I'm not sure he doesn't look too Jewish. I was doing a show across the street in Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe with my act. I was backstage seeing Danny, and I said, guess what? I'm going to Hollywood. I've got a contract. He said, with whom? I said, with Samuel Goldwyn. He said, really? So am I. Little did we dream we'd be stuck with each other for four pictures. <laughs> The first three things Sam Goldwyn said about me in a group of people was, we have to be very careful how we handle this boy because he's not good looking, he can't act, and he has no sex appeal. They tried everything. They tried photographing him, putting makeup on, and one day my mother suggested that often a person with a large nose, by changing the color of their hair, offsets it. And so the decision was made to make Danny blonde. The picture was called Up in Arms, and it came out at the time of the war. And it was about a draftee in the army. Danny played a hypochondriac in the picture. They got a hospital for just for me. One thing about Danny is he truly was a hypochondriac. Therefore, he could play it very well. He was young. He had the bloom of Broadway. Uh, which even though this town pretended to look down upon it, that was a great thing to be coming from Broadway. Danny's uh, performance in motion pictures was a natural progression from the Danny Kay that we knew at the Martinique. Who ever heard of a musical picture without Carmelita Pepita, the Bolivian bombshell? I wish you could come with me to my little village in Bolivia. So peaceful there are the purple mountains with the lovely mist and the shining stars. And the little people who live so simple and quiet. And every night all they want to do is... Conga! And I don't think anybody realized the true significance of Sylvia's contribution. Sylvia uh, was a bottomless pit, and if something wasn't working, Sylvia sensed it instantly, and she would come in and revamp it, and Danny would learn it like that. She was not a spontaneous personality like Danny was, but she appreciated humor, and she would laugh, and she could understand, and also she had a great comic sense for the type of thing that made Danny famous. You sense a, a kind of a feeling of, of resentment every once in a while, because Sylvia really was always right, and in a very quiet way, that, that, that'll drive you crazy. <laughs> When I think of Danny Kay, I think of a man whom you could ask anything of, as far as a performer is concerned, and the more difficult it was, the more fun he had doing it, and the better he did at it. I mean, the opera number in Wonder Man was the resolution of the plot. Danny is being chased by the mafia of the period who had murdered his twin brother. In order to escape, he puts on the costume of the opera singer and runs out on the stage where the heavies can't follow him. 
Now the whole idea is Danny had to give the information to the district attorney without getting killed. Ra, 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 boom, DA. DA! The lyric of the opera must give the information to the district attorney and also save Danny's life. See me! When Roosevelt died and Truman took over, Truman okayed something called the Loyalty Order of 1947. And that loyalty order meant that if any member of the government would not answer the famous question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party, they could be dismissed without a hearing. Well, I felt something had to be done about it. Ira Gershwin felt the same way. So did John Houston. And we formed this committee. And we did fly to Washington. Danny Kay was on the plane. Gene Kelly, Marsha Hunt, Richard Conte. But when we got there, the press started to attack us. Now, for most of these people, this was the first time they had ever been attacked by the press. And a lot of them couldn't take it. And the first one to cave in was Humphrey Bogart. Then Frank Sinatra dropped away, Gene Kelly dropped away, Marsha Hunt dropped away, Danny Kaye. They all divorced themselves from us. I certainly think Danny Kaye was sorry he got into this committee to defend the Hollywood Ten. He was in politics until the heat was on, and then he found he couldn't take it. Get out! Minnie! Captain Minnie, you're hurt! It's nothing, just a broken arm! I think Danny Kaye really was a Walter Mitty. I think that all of those characters that he played were he and more. Let's go. Sock stretcher. Sprinkling can. Cheese grater. Floor wax. Needle and number two threads. And he really was a sort of Dr. Marquet. He was a man of many, many parts and enormous interest. There you are, gentlemen. I am luckier than most because I have been able in my real life to work out most of the fantasies that people have who become Walter Mitty. There's Walter Mitty or uh, Wilma Mitty in every lady and every gentleman here. Everybody has their own fantasies, everybody has their own daydreams. Himmels Willen, it's Walter Mitty. I am a lost man. But he learned to fly a plane. It took him nine months at the kitchen table. I've flown a DC-10, and I've flown a 707, and I've flown a DC-8, and a 737, and a 727. But you are a chameleon, aren't you? <laughs> no, I sometimes do dramatic roles. <laughs> Love to make everybody laugh. Uh, however, when he was in a bad mood, he was very sullen, and he would go off by himself and uh, pick at his fingers and just brood. He was quite a brooder. And he was also, um, he was sort of starstruck, I think, at that point. Um, and then there was all that problem with Sylvia. Sylvia knew, in many respects, more about Danny than he knew about himself. You could see this duality raging in Danny. He was dependent upon her, but resented being dependent upon her. He wanted to be his own person, not Sylvia's creation. 1947 should have been the most successful and happiest year of Danny Kaye's life. Instead, he left Sylvia and also split with his film mentor Sam Goldwyn in a bid for independence. 
he accepted an invitation to visit the one city where he'd been a dismal failure, London. The London Palladium under Val Parnell was the top variety theatre in the 40s because of its policy of importing the best American talent. When Danny arrived in February 1948, Mickey Rooney was headlining, but he was proving a dismal failure. Rooney cancelled a matinee and didn't appear for the rest of the run. That was the point that the posters went up advertising Danny Kay at the London Palladium. The box office was a disaster. Val Parnell started giving tickets away because he wondered what Danny would say if he saw empty seats in the house. Well, if Parnell was worried, Danny was petrified. In fact, he had to be pushed onto this stage here at the Palladium by Ted Ray. And then something quite remarkable happened. The orchestra struck up. Danny faced the audience. He moved out his hands. He balled his jack. He minted his moocher. And then something very, very unusual. He moved to the center of the stage and sat down with his legs dangling. And then he started talking to the audience. No songs, no patter, he just talked to them. The place was in absolute uproar. I don't think that had ever happened before, neither had this. To quieten them down, he put a finger to his lips and said, Shh. Oh, she's a sorry about me, neither mooch you. She was the Lord down who hoochie coochie. She was the roughest and the toughest frail, but many had a heart as big as a whale. Hi, 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 hi. And it was a kind of fantastic success. And within the space of five or six weeks, I had been thrown together with people that, well, you know, uh, only the kind you would imagine in your fantasy. Famous people in all walks of life. Two very famous people, George Bernard Shaw and Danny Kaye, met recently at a tea party given by one of Mr. Shaw's neighbors in Hertfordshire. And when Mr. Shaw, now nearly 93, offered to show how film characters should make their entrances, he took these silent pictures. And these two great comedians then went on to delight their friends with their antics. Danny Kay fans were in full force at Madame Tussauds for the special ceremony there. There was a surprise in store for Danny, who kept trying to see his effigy behind the curtains. Oh, 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 oh open sesame! <laughs> First you put your tummy, 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 in a working relationship, in a marriage, and it's, those talents are highly combustible. A band, a giant reception committee, a small army of photographers, and thousands of worshipping admirers give Danny and wife Sylvia the welcome of a conqueror. Danny, I want you to tell me how you feel about the Royal Command performance. I have all. never been so thrilled in my entire life. I never wanted to do anything so badly. I'm extremely happy to be here, and I hope everything goes off well. One of the things that was wonderful about Danny was this sense of composure that he would do, is he would take the audience, spin them around, and then stop. And he would have the audience totally in the palm of his hands. The thing that, that Danny Kaye had was a kind of antic intelligence and uh, the ability to, to be real and then to just sort of lose it. I mean, he was just, he was so out of control and yet totally in control. He had 
class. Lots of class. First you put your two knees close up tight. You swing them to the left and then you swing them to the right. Step around the floor kind of nice and light. And then you, you didn't make me laugh. All of them might. Spread your love and all. Class has nothing to do about where you come from. I've known people who come from all the right sides of the tracks and they have no class. I've known a lot of people who were born dead poor. They had all the class in the world. I don't think that I really realized how famous he was until basically I was an adult. And I remember my mother telling me stories um, when uh, I was nuts about the Beatles. And she said, but that's what it was like when your father was at the Palladium. I think he owned it, in a way, forever. Hans Christian Andersen had been a long time dream of my father's. He was fascinated by the subject of this incredibly ugly, incredibly unhappy man who created all these lovely legends for children. And he'd started working on it in the 30s. I remember his first choice, he tried to get Chaplin to do the part. And then somebody suggested Danny. I'm Hans Christian Andersen and this is an April day. The Danes were appalled that a Jewish comedian from Brooklyn was going to play their national hero. Goldwyn was very uh, difficult. He knew what he wanted and uh, he knew it without knowing it because it was each time an adventure. He knew where he wanted to go but he didn't know how to go there, so you realize it was hell for everybody. All right, no, 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 Sylvia. It was my first picture, and I had the great difficulties to speak because I, I, I was not speaking English. I had a teacher all day long following me everywhere <laughs> to teach me. My head was like that, it was terrible. But then he was helping a lot. It is possible, isn't it? Could you do it? Uh, yes. Yes, I can do it. Danny took some. on the tutorial chores of teaching her how to speak properly. Like a no two people, which in music goes quite quickly. And Danny would say, no two people. And he would, he would accentuate each vowel. No two people have ever been so in love. Been so in love. Been so in love. Been so in love. It's incredible no two people have ever been so in love. Been so as my love enough. And this is unique, the positive pico. We are the most unusual couple on No two people have ever moon such a moon. June such a June. What he means is that no two people have ever been so in tune as my macaroon and I. There's a different, softer Danny in those songs. There's a whole uh, emotional quality which wasn't in the early pictures. A swan? Me a swan? Go on. He said, yes, you're a swan. Take a look at yourself in the lake and you'll see. And he looked and he saw and he said, I am a swan. Not such an ugly duckling, no feathers all stubby and brown. For in fact, these birds in so many words said, the best in town. The best, the best, the best in town. Not a quack, not a quack, not a waddle or a quack, but a glide and a whistle and a snowy white bag. And a head so noble and a heart Say who's an ugly duckling, not I
to me. He was very introvert and he was doing the clown, he was doing he was rehearsing what he was he was getting in shape for what he was going to perform and then suddenly whoop just finished and he was he was not with you. I mean he was away. He he, he was strange and special and uh, and sad in a way. I think it was a very happy uh, incident that uh, Danny Kay was going to Europe uh, on an airplane and uh, sitting next to him was Maurice Pate, the first executive director of UNICEF, and they got to be talking. And the interest of uh, Danny in children was very obvious. When you're talking to people like these, well, you just keep talking and hope your ignorance isn't showing. Mr. Pate told him the problems of children in the third world countries, how many of them died before the age of two or three. In fact, even the first year, the infant mortality was so high in some of the countries, as high as 150 per thousand. And that, I think, stirred uh, Danny into doing something. He was given a UN laissez-passer, in which he was identified a UN goodwill ambassador for UNICEF. He was the first of these uh, so-called ambassadors at large, or goodwill ambassadors and uh, he was probably the most effective. To us, Danny was a major star. But for the children in the, in the village in Thailand, he was just a foreigner with red head, with funny looking shoes, jumping around. It's good for you, good for you, good for you. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, baby. Good for you, That's all? No more? No! No! A very cynical German journalist came up to me the other day and said, don't you think that work for UNICEF is a little bit like a raindrop on a hot stone, which is a German saying. And I said, no, I'm an optimist. I think it's a drop in the ocean. Children automatically flocked to him. He was very good with them. And there was something of, of, of the child in his nature anyway. There was a feeling of uh, fundamental helplessness. He managed to retain, knowingly, some of the childlike naivete with which youngsters approach the world. All these boats are my boats. There's the cruiser. There's the destroyer. There's the motorboat. There's the bow chef. <laughs> and over there in the corner by my big toe, is the L-M-S-O-T. The only trouble is, they all sank. All except one, the submarine. <laughs> it wasn't that he was childlike, as if he was connected to his instincts, which made him open to other people, other children, and um, made him able to respond in whatever the appropriate way was for the occasion. I was shocked to hear about the Duchess. What did the Duke do? Pardon? The Duke. What did the Duke do? Uh, the Duke do? Yes. And what about the Doge? Oh, the Doge. Yeah. What did the Doge do? The Doge do? Yes, the Doge do. Well, uh, the Doge did what the Doge does. Oh, when the Doge does his duty to a Duke, that is. What? What's that? Oh, it's very simple, sir. When the Doge did his duty and the Duke didn't, that's when the Duchess did the dirt to the Duke with the Doge. Who did what? How would you like to have to be funny? You must 
love it a great deal, and I think Danny loved it a great deal, just as he loved standing up in front of a symphony orchestra. <laughs> The thing that Danny enjoyed most about show business was conducting the New York Symphony because that was, uh, to him, comedy in a way that nobody else was doing. Danny had never studied music. He couldn't read a musical score. It would mean nothing to him. He'd pick up any page and one would look like another. He would listen to a very complicated piece of music and he'd be able to sing back the most complex rhythms imaginable. He would sing the complicated parts, for example, in the Stars and Stripes Forever, and unfailingly bring in each member of the orchestra right on cue. Here he comes, called the French horn. Here comes Signor Pizzicato. All right, gentlemen, let us begin. And Tubby began to play his own little melody. Oh, that wretched tuba snapped the violins. He'll disgrace us. The trombone stuck out his tongue. Yeah. And the trumpet snickered. Yeah. Tubby, said Signor Pizzicato. Tubby, I've never heard a tuba play a melody before. Would you play the rest of it? Oh, said Tubby. He did quite a few children's records. One very well-known one was Tubby the Tuba. <laughs> Why, how perfectly wonderful, said the strings. Please, Tubby, may we sing your tune, too? Poor Tubby, who never gets a chance to play a solo, he just plays oompa oompa in the background. Tubby is given a solo and soars forth. And they all play. I met Danny the first time when I was cooking at the Beverly Bullshit Hotel. And afterwards he came into the kitchen and said, where's the chef? Let me, you know, let me see him. And he was really very excited. Danny became interested in Chinese cooking. Now, when Danny became interested in something, there were no half measures taken. He went the whole way. He spent lots of time in the kitchens of the superb top Chinese restaurants in San Francisco Chinatown. He would put any waiter of the Benihana chain to shame by throwing the knife higher and catching it in a more dangerous manner than any other meat cleaver of the Orient. I think if Danny Kay would have become a, a cook or a chef in his early days, he would be one of the greatest ever. Two by two, the animals two by two. It was in 1970 that something very strange happened. For the first time for 30 years, Danny Kay was back on Broadway in a new show by Richard Rogers called Two by Two. It was the Noah's Ark stories that were happening to a lower middle class Bronx family. Well, it was predictable. The reviews were terrific and the show was a sellout. It's wonderful going, boating with a floating zoo. Our trouble didn't really start until Danny, one night in his jumping around on stage, fell off a plank that he, that he walked down, and if, if he didn't break his leg, he came very damn near to it. And he was in a cast. And um, he was immediately put into um, New York Hospital and had announced that he was going home and that he was, had to leave the show. And I said, Danny, I think you're making a mistake in going back to California. You are going to sit there in your kitchen and you're going to stew. 
why don't you come back and do the show in a wheelchair and then in crutches and then as a cane as you get better? I will write you a set of ad-libs. The show didn't exactly suffer from Danny being in the wheelchair. Of course, it was the talk of Broadway. It got into all the newspapers. And Peter Stone's ad-libs were so good that Danny, of course, added his own. I mean, he rolls down a ramp in his wheelchair and he puts on the brakes the last minute and he makes reference to the fact that if he had gone through the wall, he would be in the show next door. And he started doing it a lot. Very shortly thereafter, he was sort of out of control. Noah was now out of the window, but Danny Kaye was in his element. And so were the audiences. They were laughing, shouting, screaming for a Danny Kaye show just as they had done in the old days. The only person who didn't like it was Richard Rogers, who from that moment on didn't speak to Danny again. And when Danny left the show, it folded, because without him, there was no show. He never went back to Broadway and only made one more major film on a subject very close to his heart. It was about the American Nazi Party doing a demonstration, and Skokie was full of um, Jews. Jews who were living there, and particularly survivors from the Holocaust. I think he really felt that, that role from his soul in a different way, perhaps, than some of the other things, you know, he had done. I mean, after all, he was Jewish. He had a very powerful scene in a synagogue where he um, uh, bears his arm. You know what this is? A tattoo, a number. Fear and Swansik, Fear Zex and Isaac. It's a concentration camp number. Do you know what that meant? Can you know what really happened? Can you know what the swastika was? Can you know what is a Nazi? He felt uh, unsure about the business of acting and the way he had to act. Um, he used to, he, he did this the first time, and I really didn't know what he was up to. He said to me, just hold it a minute, just hold it, hold it. And he stepped forward and addressed the crowd and said, now, if I hold up one finger, you sing, you lot here, those three, ring, ah. Uh, and now two fingers, you lot here, ah. Uh, and the three fingers, ah. Uh, and then he said, they went, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, and they were all singing together, and he got a whole, uh, a whole sort of scene going with the thing, and I believe it was something that he used to do in his act years ago. But he did that for about five minutes, and he got applause. They applauded him for it because they loved him for it, and then he felt happy, and he would go on acting. I came here to sit, to listen, not to say anything. But I don't want to hear about tactics and strategies. This is not a game. I will not go home. I will not pull down the window shades. Not this time, not in my own town. If a Nazi marches here in Skokie, you can believe me, I will be there. I will be there with baseball bats, with a gun, with anything. I will be there in Skokie with the Nazis alive. Many people have felt he never fulfilled his potential. I remember saying to him, I wish he would do more, more movies. And he said, you know, I can't do those old I don't remember if he said Danny Kay movies, but you know, the up in arms, the Walter, but he said, I'm different and the times are different. Maybe it bored him, having done, having uh, climbed that mountain. He had outlived his, his spot, his place. When your parent gets ill and you know they're gonna die, you become a child again. You're a combination of parent you know, I mean, I used to sit in the hospital and feed him. And you become a combination of parent and child. Suddenly, who should arrive while we're eating but Danny Kay? And he came over to Sylvia and he wished her a happy birthday and he kissed her. And he was in the hospital at the time. He'd been brought by an ambulance. And then a week after that, he was gone. Danny was one of the great comedians of the cinema. I think he, in his own way, of course, he's more verbal than a, a Keaton or a Chaplin, but he certainly is right up there with, in my opinion, with, a, uh, with, with the best of them. As a performer and an artist, 
I think he stands alone. But did you put the pellet with the poison in the vessel with the pestle? No. The pellet with the poison is in the flagon with the dragon. The vessel with the pestle has the brew that is true. The pellet with the poison is in the flagon with the dragon. The vessel with the pestle has the brew that is true. Just remember that. Yes, thank you very much. The pellet with the, the chasley. Uh, the pellet with the poison is in the pasley with the chasley. Uh, just remember that. He was my friend. Sometimes he was my Chinese cook. Sometimes he was my pilot. But I don't feel that I really ever knew who Danny was. He was so many different people. I don't think Danny knew who he was himself. I don't think anybody knew Danny really well. And that's probably our fault as much as it would be Danny's. And I'm sorry that, that I didn't get to know him better because I would like to have known him better. And I hope he wasn't, I hope he was shy. I hope he wasn't sad.